How's everybody doing? Can you hear me all right? Uda. That's funny. <laughs> I'm doing very uh, Brie tonight. Creamy and calorie filled. Um, so, sorry about the confusion. Uh, I had some weird stuff with the, uh, um, I had an old Collaborate link I was using for it from an old course, blah, 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 blah. So I had to redirect, but I'll fix it. I just, it was just, I just realized I didn't have access to that old BB Collaborate when I was gonna go open it up. So th they changed it. Anyway, not a problem, all sorted. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is um, climate adaptation or climate change and uh, environmental management, environmental management and climate change. Um, and this is a pretty interesting topic to look at right now. So um, first question is why is this important? So why do you think why do you think we need to look at climate change in the context of environmental management? Anybody? Why is it important to look at that? These two issues. What is what does environmental management have to do with it? Emissions are. are regulated in price, sure, and therefore, exactly, key, you can't, you can't deal with this issue without environmental management. So if you hear anybody saying, talking about climate change, and then you say, well, I mean, what's your, What's your environmental management approach to this then? And they don't have an answer for you, or they say, what do you mean, environmental management? Then you just say, well, look, I think we're gonna stop this conversation right now. Because without bringing environmental management into the discussion, it's a, frankly, it's a waste of, it's a waste of time talking about it in terms of doing anything about it. Because that is, the vehicle for addressing climate change is environmental management at, at the end of the day, like that is, probably the, the way I would phrase it, the way I would put this into something we can actually work with. So it's obvious, I think, personally, it's obvious to people who work in this field. Um, but what is specifically, what does environmental management have to do with it? Well, um, first and foremost, what is it? What is environmental management? That's the first question is, uh, if we were to look at, say, environmental management systems, ISO 14001 or what have you, uh, what, what would you say that is? Like, what is an EMS? What's an environmental management system based on what you've seen so far? Set of guidelines, policies, procedures, documentation, potentially tools. It's all of those things. So it's all of those mechanisms and procedures and policies and guidelines following this plan, do, check methodology to help you manage or control any issue that's relating to environmental concern and also human concern. So if we look at this issue specifically, um, we have, uh, you know, some really core data that we need to have in order to make any kind of specific actions, tangible actions on climate change. Now, if we look at environmental management tools in general, then that's more than just environmental management systems, but you look at various types of kind of tool sets that we'll be looking at and this have looked at so far in the course that relate to action on climate change, right? So, in terms of climate change itself, we need to determine what are the things that we need to think about, like what are the big challenges, right? So 
already Stephanie's noted that one of the big challenges is emissions, right? That's kind of one of the core issues there. However, in addition to that, there's another aspect of it as well, um, a lot of different dimensions to it. But if we're to categorize action into on climate change into two categories, what would they be? So emissions control would be, I would say it falls pretty much in the mitigation part of the, part of things, right? You want to mitigate or reduce greenhouse gas emissions, right? So what's the other aspect then? Adaptation, exactly. So we've talked about this, I believe, before some of you in previous courses, but the, there, there's two kind of sides to the, the, the kind of the whole action around climate change particularly if you look at officially in UNFCCC, even Canadian context, you have mitigation and adaptation. So we have to look at then what is the role of um, environmental management or environmental management tools in either or both of those, right? So in terms of climate change mitigation, um, what does it mean? Like what does climate change mitigation mean? So I'm going to ask you, what does this mean, mitigation? Stop greenhouse gases from going into the atmosphere and potentially sequestering them as well, sucking them out of the atmosphere and putting them into something that is going to keep it fixed, sequestered. So essentially it means reducing greenhouse gas emissions so what is involved with that? Like what, what do we do when we do that? So uh, one thing is we need to account for it, right? So greenhouse gas footprinting is one thing that you, you have to do. You know, knowing your greenhouse gas emissions is essential. So this can be achieved through carbon footprinting, but carbon footprinting is one aspect of your environmental management system. Right? So as we look deeper into this and look at examples of environmental management systems which we're looking at now, you'll see in pretty much every one these days, there's going to be a component of that that deals with energy use or energy efficiency and then reporting on greenhouse gas emissions on some sort of regular time interval, whether it be quarterly or it could be uh, semi-annually or annually, whatever. But it has to happen, right? So that there's one component which is just monitoring and tracking progress on that for an organization. And that is a part of environmental management. But there's other forms of reductions that can be achieved in different ways. So things when we talk about mitigation, that means you're doing something to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or sequester them, right? So one is operational efficiency, you're becoming more efficient. Uh, one is new technology. So uh, technology that is going to take the place of old carbon intensive technology, right? So what will be an example of that? If we're gonna adopt new technology. Solar, exactly, perfect example. Solar, wind, geothermal. Uh, there's a lot more talk these days about hydrogen as you have seen in the news having a hydrogen strategy, which is, is awesome. Like it's a uh, very surprising and a pleasant surprise. So all of those things seems to parallel an LCA exactly. Well, an LCA, you know, like it's a good point, Jason, in the sense that, you know, an LCA, as we'll get to for those that, you know, are, are new to this course, um, is a process by which it, you look at the life cycle of a product or a service. And you can track then going through you know, time or the value chain of that product, how much green, how many greenhouse gas emissions, how much energy has been used all the way through like a barrel of oil or creation of a fan or, or any product. But it, like from an environmental management system standpoint, you have a whole organization, right? So if you're looking at the organization, you say, okay, well, we're producing X many fans per quarter. And then you would then have all the greenhouse gas emissions for that based on all the data that you're gathering, some of which could come from an LCA. That would be one of the tools you would have within this kind of overall framework. But the EMS, an environmental management system, is the process by which you document all that stuff. So it is. It's parallel and they're complementary. In fact, you use them 
usually in a company, the people will be doing the LCA or the person doing an LCA will either be the same person doing the environmental management system if it's a smaller group or part of a team that is dealing with all of those problems. So there's a lot of kind of data sharing and collaboration that, that should occur anyway, may not always be the case. So, I mean, that the role for environmental management in that case is pretty clear. However, there's other cases in mitigation that is perhaps less clear, like in agriculture, right? So what, how do you deal with, what, what, uh, what does agriculture have to do with climate change mitigation? What are some, uh, what are some issues with, with agriculture specifically? Uh, a need for more water, kind of. Irrigation, kind of. Yeah, that's part of it because you need energy for that. There we go. Clearing of land is one, right? When you're clearing land for agriculture, clear cutting, um, this kind of thing, like say for an ag situation, a very good example is the Amazon or Indonesia or places where you have um, nutrient leaching. Not really, actually. Um, although it's a problem, it's less a problem from a climate change standpoint. In terms of clearing like say Amazonia or some place similar like that where you have tropical forest, you are taking down, uh, removing a lot of biomass that normally would be sequestering a lot of carbon, you know, circulating it, cycling it. So that land cover change, when you're reporting on climate on, uh, for your greenhouse gas emissions as a country, say like Canada and particularly developing countries that are in the tropics, they have to report on land use, they call it a LUFA, uh, land use and land cover change because agriculture, part of the impacts they have is from clearing land that normally would be a sink of carbon to produce agriculture, which is less of a sink, right? So there's that. And when they, when you go and clear land, typically what they do is they cut down the trees and then they burn it, right? So slash and burn agriculture. And there's a lot of greenhouse gas emissions that come off the land. So it's a net source of greenhouse gas emissions, that kind of clear cutting, clearing land that formerly was forest and turning it into agriculture land. So there's that. That's one. And then also in, in places like in Canada, for instance, there's a lot of impact on uh, the carbon stored in soil uh, as a result of agriculture, exactly, tilling. So tilling uh, uh, results in a lot of uh, emissions of greenhouse gas emissions uh, from, or greenhouse gases from the soil. So there's, there's a, in fact, there's a protocol called no-till agriculture. It's a process where you reduce the amount of tilling that you do in the agriculture. And if you document it and you basically formalize it, you'll see that there is uh, um, there are less emissions as a result. You document, you have a net reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from no-till agriculture. In fact, there's a protocol for monitoring and verifying that you're doing no-till agriculture for which you can get greenhouse gas emissions credits, carbon credits for no-till no agriculture. And it's used in Canada. So tilling is another one. Right, um, uh, and then also another aspect of agriculture that is resulting from uh, from greenhouse gas emissions would be, I guess, it kind of falls within agriculture. Usually, it's livestock, right? So, what happens with livestock? How do livestock contribute to climate change? Methane. How? Poop. Correct. Gas. Farting and burping. And in fact, there are some uh, people that are putting hoses on uh, livestock in order to capture methane as it's released. Um, not the greatest job. <laughs> I, think I, don't, I don't think I'd want to be signing up for that job, but um, it's it's part of it, you know, though it's a part of this kind of, you know, uh, action for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions is controlling and understanding uh, different types of emissions that come from livestock or what have you. Forestry, it's another one. So in forestry, we have deforestation is contributing to it. Uh, we also have reforestation and afforestation. This is in Canada. We've pledged to plant a billion trees or whatever it is, right? So again, it's another means by which we're reducing and ideally sequestering carbon from the atmosphere by growing trees. Uh, and then lastly, 
one other one would be uh, waste management, right? So what happens with landfills? What happens to your average landfill from a climate change standpoint? You have, again, you have methane. You have the emission of gas, methane and greenhouse gases off gassing from landfills. Landfill gas emits a fairly significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So you have landfills as well. So therefore you also have processes by which people are capturing landfill gas capture with landfill. They put a plastic sheets over the landfill and let the methane off gas, they collect it and then transport that through to generators that burn that and burn it and to create um, electricity. In fact, there's a pilot project in Nanaimo, if anybody's interested in checking it out. A, a group called Sun Current has a landfill gas capture project going on in Nanaimo and they're doing it elsewhere and they're doing awesome work. Okay, so all of these things like are some of which are probably more familiar to you than others, but the common thread through all of them is there are certain interventions that are taken either through increasing efficiency, changing technology, planting trees, changing land use, uh, modifying landfill gas capture, you know, working with agriculture, um, waste diversion or green waste, uh, that's another one actually is, is waste diversion. So one thing we don't think about is um, uh, liquid waste. So when you have heavy amount of organics and liquid waste, you get a lot of off gassing of methane and various type of organics and greenhouse gases that come off it. So you have to manage that as well. But in all these cases, what I'm trying to get at here is that whether it's operational efficiency, whether you're adopting new technology, whether you're changing agricultural practices, uh, whether you're dealing with forestry in a different way, where you're doing different types of waste management uh, and different land cover practice or different types of, of dealing with liquid and solid waste, all of those, those processes can in some ways contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But the one common thing is that you have to monitor that. You have to have a way of measuring that, right? And that is where we come in with our expertise and your knowledge that you're gaining and you've gained uh, in environmental management systems or environmental management tool that will allow you to put in a, in, a, in a process to measure that on an ongoing basis and then document it and report on it, right? And so we'll get to reporting later on for those that are in the course, those that have taken the course understand that, but that's a critical component of this whole, whole problem in mitigation. If you can't monitor this stuff, you can't manage it. Or it doesn't matter what kind of policies you have. If you have no way of measuring this stuff, then forget about it. We're not going to get anywhere. You have no basis for it. So some tools that are out there for you to look at and take a look at are first and foremost, the most basic one is greenhouse gas accounting tools, right? So here's one link here. This is the uh, from the CSA. So this is the Canadian Standards Association has their Clean Start Registry, which is a registry for companies to uh, register what their greenhouse gas emissions are after they've gone through accounting for them. Um, here's an, another one <clears throat> uh, called the Carbon Trust, um, which is um, uh, another guide. This is a guide to carbon footprinting. And there's a lot of, so if you happen to get into this stuff, um, there's a lot of different methodologies out there. There's not just one gold standard. There's the ISO 14064 standard for carbon footprinting, which is probably one of the most recognized and uh, respected standards, I guess. Whereas there's other procedures out there that are more specific to certain industries, like uh, the American Petroleum Institute API has a, has a standard for, for greenhouse gas accounting for refineries and, and hydrocarbon operations. And similarly in mining, they have some industry specific processes. But you, know, you choose your standard, you choose your, the method that you're gonna be doing it, and then you execute on it, and then you document it. And here's another one on um, the footprinting network, which is a good resource on carbon footprinting. Okay, so all of those things, and it doesn't, so you can see the diversity of, of the different applications. And these are all things that I guarantee you, like you're gonna have opportunities to work on this stuff if you choose to, 
carry on down this path because it's all happening now, right? Like really in a very, very big way. And you need to have the proper tools in place to do the work and then know how that fits within the overall kind of scheme of things. So the other component of uh, a climate change that we need to think about um, is adaptation, right? So in, in terms of adaptation, um, the one thing that we, you know, if we're looking at, at the kind of the global perspective is to look at where things are at. So if you're kind of faced with doing a, say a climate adaptation strategy for, um, for a company, one of the first things I suggest you look at uh, if you're kind of uh, new to this is to look at the IPCC. So the IPCC, I've shared this with some of you before, is, um, is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And that is like the global authority for um, reporting and documenting the status of, uh, of the climate and its impacts. And they have different working groups. I won't go too far into it because it's not the focus of this today. But uh, the, the, they, these working groups, so working group two is the one that's focused on adaptation. And so uh, there's different um, uh, assessment reports that are created by the IPCC on a periodic basis, which are what the world countries use internationally to assess where we're at with kind of the impacts as well as adaptation. And the last assessment report that was created uh, was uh, this one, which is the fifth assessment report, All right? So if you want to find out more about this, uh, feel free to look at um, the latest working group two, which is the adaptation um, assessment report. And that allows you to see, you know, what are the, what are the aspects of, of adaptation that we need to think about? So if you look at, at those chapters in that, in that report, some of the key things that will pop up are um, management of natural resources and systems and their uses. So for instance, freshwater resources, terrestrial and inland resources, coastal systems, low-lying areas, ocean systems, food security and food production, uh, human settlements uh, is another area that they focus on. So urban areas, rural areas, key economic sectors, and all of this, if you think about it, we need to think of you know, the stuff that we rely on, we use and we inhabit, and then how will that be affected by climate change? Therefore, what will we need to do to react to it or adapt to it? Human health is another component of it that they document quite thoroughly. Human health impacts, adaptation, co-benefits, right? So one of the human health things I've dealt with uh, on the adaptation front is um, the transmission of infectious diseases. So in some of the places that I've worked because of climate change, they've got a higher uh, propagation of mosquitoes uh, and different, uh, uh, there's just more mosquitoes in certain areas and therefore more vectors for certain diseases. And we see it in the data where there's more, there's more incidences of malaria, for instance, in some of these countries as a result of the change in climate. It's just starting right now. So that's one of the things. Human security is another dimension. Livelihoods and poverty all fall within human health um, uh, impacts, adaptation, and co-benefits. Uh, adaptation itself, so needs and options, adaptation planning, adaptation op uh, opportunities, the economics of it, multi-sector impacts. So things that are relevant to is key areas of vulnerability and opportunities, and then some regional aspects. So if we're looking at, that's kind of how that's framed internationally, adaptation. So if you want to think of things then from an environmental management standpoint, if you look at a, the, the bulk of those issues, um, whether it be urban environments, whether it be human health, all of them require you to have some sort of kind of tool in place to do either, usually it's related to, for adaptation, related to risk and vulnerability. Those are the two big things that you think about in adaptation, because often it's, uh, you know, it's the vulnerability of the economy, vulnerability of human health, and then vulnerability of ecosystem health and species that we need to think about. Are we greater, have a greater exposure to disasters and so forth? So you look at it from that standpoint, then you say, okay, well, what kind of environmental management tools make sense uh, for that issue in this region. So as we started to look at in the course um, for the environmental aspects and their impacts, part of that gets to, well, what is the risk, right? So some of the aspects you identified, those that were working on the pipeline stuff said, well, look, there could be some, some uh, pollution, some uh, uh, persistent organic pollutants. It could be VOCs or something like that.
And then when you look at that, you say, well, okay, well, great. We'll have some, we'll have some, uh, the potential for an oil spill, we'll have some leaking gasoline or whatever it is. But the other component of that is, well, who cares? Like, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because that may, that aspect and that impact might be significant enough to affect human health, ecosystem health, or, um, or some sort of operational risk. But it's the risk component of that that I'm trying to equate here is that with an adaptation, it's largely about looking at vulnerability and risk, and you need tools in order to assess that. So in the Canadian context, um, Canada has put a lot of effort into that, actually, uh, and I'm going to share with you some links uh, that they've been working with um, here. So if you go to that link there, you will see um, we're actually uh, really impressive on this front. So adapting to climate change in Canada, what is it? They explain it, but then they have a bunch of services and information about it, as well as you know funding and so forth. Um, but the big thing here is is you know understanding these impacts, right? So if you go to this link here, we'll take you to a page that um, explains. Um, uh, climate services, right? So how to understand the impacts of climate change, um, understanding climate change, climate services, and research to support adaptation, right? So uh, you need to really understand where we'll, we're vulnerable. So the climate services part of that, if you go to that link there, this may be old hat for some of you, this may be new for some of you, um, but I think it's important for you to know that these are out there because um, it's really helpful for, for work. If you look at the Canadian Centre for Climate Services, you know, this is a great resource um, for looking at, um, you know, potential risk. What's, what is the climate going to look like 30, 40, 50 years from now in a certain region in Canada? So if you look at uh, the display and download climate data, you can see that you have uh, the Climate Atlas of Ca Canada, but you also have this climate data um, dot CA. And if you look at that, you will then be able to go, are you able to access that climate data? This one here. Um, so you can search for a town. So I'm gonna go look for uh, Victoria, BC. Nanaimo, okay. Nanaimo. So uh, if I go here, I've, this is, uh, I'll just put this through. I've looked at Nanaimo, right? So I can look at the Nanaimo, and let's just say we're operating some sort of, I don't know, a forestry operation up there, or what have you. Uh, this will give you um, a whole breakdown. If you scroll down on that, it'll look, show you. Um, what the uh, gridded, the historical, uh, and then the projected climate change according to different models that they've used, right? And then you can also look at this on a map, which is handy, right? It can show you, um, and granted, this is pretty coarse resolution because this is climate model output, so I believe it's eight kilometer by eight kilometer or something like that. But what it gives you then, if you take a close look at this, is some sort of understanding of where there might be some problems in the future. And I don't want to go too far into this. Um, I just want to give you an idea of, of the role uh, that you're going to play potentially in using these kind of tools for helping decisions. So for instance, if you're dealing with water resources or the risk of flood or what have you, I mean, these are the kind of things that you'd want to be looking at. These are the kind of tools that you'd want to uh, call on and perhaps even more sophisticated ones, ones that uh, draw on uh, higher resolution models or downscaled models or what have you. So then you have the policies that go along with that here. Okay, if you go to that link, you'll see um, the associated policies. Okay, and this uh, gets into the plans and the frameworks and so forth. And this is particularly exciting right now. Now they have reference to the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, Greening Government Strategy, 
federal adaptation policy framework, the Arctic policy, federal sustainable development, uh, all these kind of things. Now, I don't believe the latest uh, bill is on here yet uh, because that's kind of fresh out of the tracks. But this is kind of the resources that you'd want to look to from a, from a policy standpoint to kind of get your grounding in the country. Um, and then you also have provincial resources. So I'll leave it at there. And then you have uh, provincial resources here. And this is, say, if we're dealing with British Columbia, this is the provincial um, site for climate adaptation. Okay. So if you go there, you'll see um, all the actions underway. Um, they have some preliminary strategic climate risk assessments, so 15 climate risks. So this is pretty pretty impressive stuff that they've done. So this this uh, are, if you go to this uh, page here, they've produced a report, uh, which is still pretty new. I mean, it was last year in July that they produced it, but it's a good breakdown, and I recommend when you get some time uh, to take a look at that. Um, just to get a better understanding of how this is occurring in, at least in BC, and there's similar work that's ongoing in other, other provinces. Um, because uh, it's one thing to look at the IPCC, so when we started internationally, which is very broad, and then nationally, I feel, especially with Canada, it's quite broad, so we've got a big country. But then once you get to the provincial level, whether you're in BC, Ontario, Alberta, Manitoba, whatever, um, you get a little more granular with with things like in general and you can really see how it's relevant to different stakeholders whether you're a community like say if you're working for a municipality or maybe you're working for a company or an NGO or whatever it's the provincial level where you can really see and even at the city level like in Vancouver or, or Victoria as well you can really see how those actions um, for adaptation really kind of take uh, take root right so we also have some other tools in BC PICS uh, Pacific uh, Climate Institute. Um, I'll share that one too, just for uh, for the heck of it. Okay. Uh, and then uh, disaster mitigation, uh, and then also some work that Enercan is uh, is undergoing. So these are some kind of the re the information resources that I would suggest that you take a look at if you're starting at working on this kind of stuff. But in terms of um, uh, tools. So how do we go about um, put it, getting to work on this stuff? Okay. So if I re re rewind and go back to our beginning of our discussion, the first thing uh, we'd look at is environmental management systems. Like that is one environmental management tool that is going to allow you to, you know, quantify and, and provide the information to decision makers as to what they need to do. Um, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, right? But you also have other um, types of tools out there or strategies and so forth, some of which are very, very useful. So this one here is from the CPA, uh, Canadian Professional Accounting uh, Association, right? Which is, you know, you wouldn't think that the CPA Institute would have a heck of a lot to do with environmental stuff, but they actually do. Like, they do some really remarkable stuff. So that's one kind of... Um, how is your business adapting to climate change? It's kind of a, a just a, an, an article. And then there's some case studies there that uh, I can just share the, the links with you right away. One, one is from the city of Montreal from a climate adaptation standpoint. So how would a city um, uh, deal with that? So they looked at say, what is the, what are the projected changes? What is our strategy? What is the role of CPAs and so forth and so on? Um, you also could look at certain industries, right? So another industry that is definitely being impacted by climate change is the insurance industry, right? So this is a nice case study uh, that's featured on the CPA um, organization about the cooperators, which is an insurance corporation uh, that, um, you know, obviously is taking this seriously, as are most, right? Intact is another one that's really taking climate change seriously. So those are like, in terms of environmental management, those are more strategic tools. So if you were to look at, say, adaptation, and let's just say you were the person who has just pulled into a new for a forestry company that just, you know, uh, really wanted to get sustainability uh, under control. You would want to look at the greenhouse gas emissions part of things. You'd also want to look at, um, like, just environmental management in general, so any kind of pollutants, toxins, EHS stuff. You'd also want to think about the climate adaptation component of things, because that's a big issue for forestry 
and I think you can understand why. It's going to impact the growing season. It's going to impact the, the logging roads. It's going to impact uh, the markets, all that kind of stuff. So you want to have these kind of a, a suite of tools that you can start to use in this umbrella. So environmental management is an overall umbrella for you to kind of work. And then there's some other tools out here that I'd like to share with you that I think are useful uh, for adaptation. So here's one from the EPA. Okay. Um, and then uh, these are, this is one from British Columbia. So if you go to that EPA one, just a sec, let me get it on myself. Um, they've listed here some tools such as climate change tools, comprehensive lists. So there's some really, they're doing a really good job. This is a great resource, like just as a list of, of different types of tools. They have a climate change vulnerability uh, tool for fish and wildlife, which is great, forest health impact and vulnerability assessments, decision-making, uh, species level, uh, some, uh, this is great. So, I mean, uh, take some time to look through what they have here. They actually have this climate adaptation tools inventory, which is a list of all these different tools uh, that are potentially useful for, um, for a bunch of different things. I mean, even they get into to genetics. Um, so that's a great little resource to take a look at. Uh, and then we have uh, this, other specific tools. So those are some generic ones. That's the BC one. Um, and this is the EPA as well has this list of different tools. So this is the one I had sent, uh, this one here. So that's the EPA one. If you look at this, they have a bunch, they have a list of air quality and all, all the way through water management and so forth. Some of these are actual tools and then some of them are kind of strategic tools. Um, the BC stuff that I was referring to can be found here at this link. So if you take a look at this link here for the BC, um, again, really unique and specific tools. And that's the thing, like there's, it's not like a really focused area. There's a lot of different things that may be impacted. Habitat may be impacted. Um, you know, behavior of, of different populations or species might be impacted. So you kind of have to, vet through all of the things that are available and, and figure out what you need to work on and then choose the right tools that are going to give you the answers you need right but there's a lot of resources these are just a, a, a small kind of sliver of what's available uh, tourism specific the U, un has done some pretty interesting work on un this is a, a kind of a list of the tool sets that they have for tourism both from a mitigation and adaptation standpoint now, it's, I mean, that's relevant to Canada. And as I understand it, this tourism has really been impacted actually in Canada positively in some ways because less people are doing traveling for, for COVID. So they're traveling, they're being tourists in their backyard. So that then presents a whole bunch of new challenges. Um, and some of the work that I've been doing in the Caribbean, this is another big part of it is, is finding ways to make the tourism industry adaptive to climate change because it's much more of a, a severe issue there in terms of frequency of storms and the impact on those businesses. So this, um, this uh, publication here will give you give some good ideas of frameworks, tools, and practices for climate change adaptation and mitigation in the tourism sector. Oftentimes it's sector specific, I have found. Uh, and then we have geospatial tools. I've already shown you the, the Canadian government ones, right, through the CLEM data tool set. So if you look at this though, this is from, I believe this is NOAA. Uh, let me double check the link. Uh, yes, it's NOAA, climate.gov. So this is the, the, the American uh, um, uh, group that, that they deals with oceans and atmospheric issues. So NOAA has a whole bunch of tools and, and uh, mapping tools and climate maps and so forth that are really helpful for not just North America, but also, well, yeah, most of it's North American, but a lot of their, their tools can be applied and used internationally. In fact, we're using some of them on other projects. And then lastly, uh, modeling. So um, I've shared with you already some of the modeling studies that have been done and tools that are existent for, for Canada. And this is that link once again, 
um, to uh, this is to the Canadian Centre for Climate Modeling and Analysis, which would, of course, um, be providing information to that climate um, website that I showed you. These are the groups that are, you know, running the models and looking at the output and then sharing that data. So again, I mean, modeling is one component. You can't do these projections without having the model data to, to utilize. All right. So um, to summarize then, uh, what is kind of the linkage between environmental management and climate? Can you see, can, do you see the linkage now that, you know, that one can't be addressed without the other? Does that make sense? So um, given that then, looking at the recent announcement that has come through, uh, which are wide sweeping and um, the goals to become, um, you know, reach our targets uh, and to have a carbon tax, I believe it was by 20, in 10 years, is it 2030, uh, 170, something like that, right? $170 per ton, 2030, that's yeah, 170 by 2030. So now, okay, so we have then these policies that have been put out there, um, which are obviously, so there's going to be some pushback from certain groups. Um, but regardless of what happens, I mean, you could half the price, you know, uh, you know make it a hundred bucks, you know, or make it whatever. Um, what this really does though, by putting this kind of real price on carbon, uh, it's going to force this issue even more. It's just pure economics is the, uh, if the price is punitive enough, they invoke action. That's the theory behind um, carbon taxation as a policy instrument. So given that then, I mean, let's just say like, let's fast forward it. The government decides to be really ambitious and fast forwards this whole movement by, you know, four years and we have like a carbon tax that's doubled by next year. Certainly organizations are going to start to be paying more attention to greenhouse gas emissions because it's going to result in economic costs, right? And so in order to kind of have a good handle on that, you really need to have the tools to project what the emissions will be from certain strategies, actions, programs, or whatever, uh, and then document what they are, right? Because there's built-in accountability into these processes, which will definitely translate down to the organization level. And that is the role then for environmental management, is to provide this kind of like framework and the understanding to um, deal with it and document it and track progress over time, right? And so we're gonna see carbon taxation as a policy tool. We're also going to be seeing far more emphasis on technology transitions, right? So hydrogen is going to play much more, more of a role. Um, uh, hydro will, uh, all the transition, te transmission technology, smart grids and so forth. All of that stuff is going to play a big, a transportation, right? And all of that stuff will need, require kind of this kind of, uh, procedures and processes for monitoring greenhouse gas emissions to report on that, to make sure we're actually making some progress. In addition to that, uh, there's certain things that were, will be unavoidable. There's changes that we will see that will be, um, regardless of how high the carbon tax goes, we will not be able to avoid some of these changes. And that's where you know the adaptation side of things comes in, understanding where we might be subject to risk, vulnerability, or at least change. And then there's a whole suite of, of tools and strategies and so forth, some of which I've shared with you tonight, that will need to be employed and they will need to fit within the strategy for these organizations, whether it be a government operating in municipal, provincial, or federal or international level, or a company or, or, or some sort of professional organization that needs to deal with this stuff, right? So that is uh, in a nutshell, in, you know, an hour, how environmental management is a fundamental piece of dealing with climate change. We cannot deal with it without environmental management. And therefore, what you are working on in this course uh, is going to be a very useful tool set and skill set for you to, um, you know, be an agent of, uh, of, of change for this going forward. And fortunately for you, uh, the world has woken up to the issue, <laughs> like big time in the past couple of years. It's been happening for a while, but it really, really, this is a flashpoint. Much like we had in 2005, 
when Al Gore's movie came out around there, that was a flashpoint where you saw a distinct change in how people dealt with it. And, and now in the last year, two years, um, we've got another flashpoint, which I predict will have perhaps an even greater impact as that last flashpoint in 2005 in terms of action. But action means doing and action means having professionals to take care of it then, and that's you. Any questions? Make sense? So going forward, uh, what I would recommend, and I will share the, uh, the, the, the Word document PDF uh, with, uh, with these links. If there's an area, like say, for instance, if you're working in, uh, in oil and gas or whatever, you know, whatever it is you like, um, look at some of these tools. I mean, obviously not all of them are going to apply. I think the, the national things for Canada uh, are worth your time to really dig into and look at. You may consider, and then for specific things. So if you're in oil and gas, or say if you're doing your, you say if you're working more on the wildlife side of things, then look at some of those uh, issue specific or industry specific tools. Uh, and, and just kind of get a better feel for them because going forward, that's going to be incredibly valuable for you. Like I'm speaking kind of as a, as a professional, you can walk into a situation and, and really have at your fingertips what needs to be used for what in a given situation. And I guarantee you that that will put you in a, in a better situation than a lot of folks out there who are even working on this stuff. They don't, you know, they don't know this stuff. Like if I were to ask um, my colleagues at the UN, who uh, clients and colleagues about some of these things, I can tell you right now, they will not know that. They won't know ISO 14001, don't know it. Uh, you know, climate risk assessment using geospatial tools, don't know it. Um, you know, LCA and the importance of LCA for climate change mitigation, don't know it. So there you go. All right. Good. So um, just on the course stuff, um, for those in the course, uh, all your feedback has been sent back for the first assignments. Needs to be some work done in certain areas, but that's okay. This is the first assignment. It's supposed to be like that. So don't fret. But the key thing is to really defend your points. Um, you know, that's that was the area that I found was weakest. Um, if you're going to make a statement about whether or not something's an impact or its severity or not, you have to defend that with references. Okay? And then the other part of it is make it like it's a, a report. You know, like... So it's like you're consulting or you're producing this for someone. So give like a brief intro uh, and then you can go through the results and the matrix, whether it's an appendix or not, it's up to you. Uh, and then have a brief conclusion, which kind of just synthesizes and summarizes that. It doesn't have to be anything long. It could be a couple sentences just to kind of open it, produce your results and then bookend it. Make sense? All right, that is it for tonight. Uh, any recommendations for topics for the next? We're going to go off now until early January. We're off podcasts. So we got a couple weeks rest and relaxation, you know, chill out. Uh, and then we'll hit it back. Uh, just one sec. I guess our next one will be uh, on January the 29th. So good at time. So I'm going to send an email out and requesting some things you want to hear about. I've had some ideas, but I want to hear from you. Okay.
Uh, I sent it back to everybody. Uh, I sent uh, I sent the document back to everybody, so you should have got it. Which group are you? It went to the 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 email that is used for Moodle, so that could be the issue. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, if there's issues, I'll send out an email, and if there's issues, then then I can I can email it directly.